It was the summer of 1981. I had just turned 14 and was hovering between 8th and 9th grade. On a Saturday, one week into a two-week summer music camp in the mountains, I headed up a hill with the rest of the girls from Mozart Cabin toward a wooden build building with peeling paint and a crack in the ceiling. There was a dance that night. As we crunched up the gravel path, music pulsed through open windows. The girls around me chattered in excitement and butzed with their hair. But I was quiet as I watched my feet in their knockoff topsiders take step after step up the hill, thinking, how did I get myself dragged into this? I had known from the first day of camp when they announced a Saturday dance that I would not be going. Instead, I'd hunker down in the cabin and read a book. Because hunkering down with a book was the kind of thing I could picture myself doing. I could not picture myself dancing. You see, ever since I was a kid, I modeled myself on the people closest to me, my parents and older sister. My mother devoured books and sang in the church choir. I read like a fiend and sang in the junior choir. My father tinkered with Heathkit electronics and took piano lessons. I played with erector sets and also took piano for a year until I realized I was horrible at it and my parents let me quit. My sister despised the Dire Straits song, Sultans of Swing, and had to repeat seventh grade algebra. I also mocked Sultans of Swing and told people long before I was even in algebra that I would probably also have to repeat it. It wasn't so much that I wanted to be like them as that I didn't realize I was separate. Maybe it's because I had subconsciously picked up on the notion that I was here in this world because my mom was lonely. When my sister turned five and went to school, mom wanted another baby. And I became a child who lived to fill a need, to become whatever I thought my family expected me to be. And while my family was bookish and musical, we did not dance. In fact, I saw my parents dance only one time. They had signed up for a disco class because the 70s, and were practicing in the foyer. My mom was attempting to maneuver her hefty 5 foot 11 frame through a twirl under my dad's arm while he held her hand as high as he could. She took an ungainly turn and he tightened his lips. They both looked so awkward and uncomfortable. The spectacle of it made me wince. After the class was over, they never went out dancing. By the time I was in seventh grade, most of my peers had started to separate from their parents by retreating into sullen silence or acting out. I had no such urges. Rebelling against my parents would have been like rebelling against myself. I wanted to be an engineer like my dad, but also good with words like my mom, who had a massive vocabulary and definite opinions on how my school paper should be edited. My voice was an alto, and my instrument, now, was violin. I knew who I was and where I fit in. That is, until I was plucked from my comfortable existence in Pennsylvania and plopped down in, of all places, Las Vegas. My dad got a job there, so we moved in 1980, the summer between 7th and 8th grade. In our Pennsylvania suburb, which is all I had ever known, everyone was pretty much like me, white and middle class. Aside from the one kid from India who attended my middle school, <laughs> one flesh-colored crayon would have sufficed to depict the skin colors I saw on any <laughs> given day. In Las Vegas, I was thrown into a wildly diverse pool of other kids whose socioeconomic status ranged from free lunch to gated community. My usual ways of fitting in didn't work there. My new school didn't even have an orchestra. 
and the styles were completely different. I discovered that clogs, which all the cool girls wore at my old school, were a definite fashion don't. I learned quickly that in Vegas, the icons on your clothes determined your place in the social strata. A top-tier kid spotted an Izod alligator over their left breast, bass tag on their topsiders, and Calvin Klein sti stitching loop on the back of their jeans. I had a hush puppy basset hound on my crew neck sweater, plain green tag on my topsiders, and non-designer stitching on my lees. This clearly put me in the wannabe category, and I knew it. I desperately wanted those Izods and Calvin Kleins, which I saw as my ticket to fitting in to a desirable slot in the strata. But my parents' budget did not run to designer clothes, and I knew that too. So I made do. All I wanted was to find my place and not stick out. This was not helped by the fact that I was suddenly the smartest kid in my class. I'd gotten good grades in Pennsylvania, but now, even in honors classes, I found myself getting straight A's. This made me stand out, even among the smart kids. Don't hate me, I wanted to say. I'm not trying to break the curve. It's just working out that way. Add to this the fact that I'd shot up to five foot nine by eighth grade. I was becoming that tall new smart kid with the J.C. Penny wardrobe. I just wanted to hide. <coughs> my, strategy <coughs> my strategy became to withdraw from social interactions at school as much as possible. I asked for and got a permanent pass to go to the library instead of the cafeteria during lunch so I could avoid having to navigate where to sit. And I certainly did not go to any dances. By the end of eighth grade, I still hadn't made any good friends. At least I was going to music camp. I looked forward to playing in the string camp string ensemble, but not knowing any of the other kids made me nervous. The last thing I intended to do was go to the all-camp dance. When Saturday arrived and the other girls were trying on outfits, curling their hair, and debating the cuteness rankings of the boys in Beethoven cabin that they wanted to dance with, I was relaxing on my bunk. That is, until Anna found out about my plans. What are you wearing to the dance? Anna asked me. Anna had a camp crush on an older boy and constantly played the funk song Fantastic Voyage <laughs> on a portable boombox in our cabin. Oh, I'm not going. You're not going? Yeah, I'm just going to stay here and read. She looked bewildered. What do you mean you're not going? You've got to go. No, really, it's okay. I'd rather stay here. Other girls were starting to catch on to our conversation. Besides, I don't have anything to wear. We can help you put together an outfit, another girl added. My plan was backfiring. I hadn't expected anyone to care or even notice if I stayed behind. But now I would stick out if I didn't go. Standing my ground at this point was not an option. So I gave in to their prodding. And truthfully, I was grateful that regardless of their motivations, and I really wasn't sure what they were, they gave a damn. Fortunately, the fashion landscape at camp was more forgiving. With some help from my cabin mates, I put together a halfway decent outfit anchored by my one pair of designer jeans, a pair of Gloria Vanderbilts my mom had bought me with her employee discount at the Broadway. I French braided my long straight hair and slipped my topsiders on sockless feet because socks were for nerds. <laughs> As we headed up the hill, my stomach tied itself in knots. I did not dance. What had I gotten myself into? As the last of the summer light filtered through the surrounding trees, the day's warmth cooled into mountain chill the atmosphere was charged. The air hairs on my arms tingled. 
We got closer. Music was already pumping from inside. The doors were propped open for ventilation, and when we reached the threshold, I was swept in with the tide of girls. The romantics, what I like about you, was pulsating out of the black grill of a speaker and bouncing over the bodies of dozens of kids in there already. Folding chairs lined the pale blue walls. There was nowhere to shrink to the side and not be inches away from a clutch of bodies. I glanced out a sash window onto graying pines. I didn't want to be there, but I didn't want to go back outside. Suddenly, the opening riff of Donna Summer's Bad Girls bumped its way into the air. Come on, a girl next to me said, and then we were out into the middle of the darkened floor. What was I supposed to do? I looked at the girls to the left of me, then at some kids to my right. I could sense the beat of the music, so I did what they did, sliding my feet back and forth. The room was dark and close. Sweat and pheromones hung in the air. The beat permeated the room, and I could feel it in my core. And then I was doing it. I was dancing. <laughs> and I felt myself loosening with every step, shaking free of the narrow identity I'd confined myself to. I didn't have to be like my parents. I was good at this. Why had I thought I wouldn't like it? And before I knew it, the backup singers were chanting, Toot toot, hey, beep beep. <laughs> toot toot, hey, beep beep. I hesitated a moment, wondering what to do. But then I heard the next song starting up. Jesse is a friend. <laughs> yeah, I know he's been a good friend of mine. I knew that song, so I kept dancing. I watched the other kids but also experimented on my own. <laughs> For the first time, I wasn't worried about fitting in. No one seemed to care what I was doing, and it felt so good that I didn't care if anyone was watching as long as I could move to that beat. Rick Springfield faded out, and then it was Pat Benatar. Hit me with your best shot! <laughs> I did not leave the floor all night. After camp, I went home, back to ninth grade and my withdrawn, reserved self. But the allure of feeling that alive pulled at me. I still spent lunchtime in the library, but I joined an all-city high school orchestra and became friends with the violist I'd met at camp who would introduce me to Eurythmics and the police. And as soon as I could drive, I hunted out under 21 clubs where I danced until sweat made my eyeliner run. I threaded my way to the side of the room to catch my breath and gulp down some water, then went back out to dance some more, and I felt completely, unwaveringly, me. Give it up for Luis Julig!